everyone, welcome to today's edition of One Single Story, where each weekday we offer a brief lesson from a section of today's reading, and then we examine a single relevant question that passage points us to. This week, we're looking at a single theme woven through our reading. The, the theme is, can I trust God with my everyday life? Uh, today, I'm joined by Cheryl Daugherty, and we're looking at a passage from Genesis chapter 16. And the question that I am asking out of the gate is, can God work through all this drama? The question as we enter chapter 16 is whether or not Abraham is going to have a son in fulfillment of God's promises. Uh, we would expect this chapter to continue the narrative of Abraham directly, but instead there are other characters that suddenly take center stage, Sarah and Hagar, her handmaiden. Um, will Abraham have a son is a reasonable question. The short answer to it is yes, but the route to the fulfillment of that promise is surprising. It does not come by a straight road, but through a series of complicated actions from complex people who are all flawed, and it comes, th comes through and with a lot of drama. Um, the root brings family conflict and suffering. We see this in verses 4 through 6. The root necessitates a divine intervention to get things back on the rails, verses 7 through 9. The root heralds a promising yet surprising future for Ishmael, Abraham's son by Hagar, you see that's 10 through 12. The root issues in a revelation uh, for his mother, verses 13 and, and 14. So I want you to think about the complexities of the characters and the events that eventually lead to Abraham's promised son, Isaac, uh, being born. So Sarah feels like she's failed as a wife because she can't have children. So here's this mother who feels like she has no self-worth. That was a big deal then because she cannot have a baby. And is God at work when we're discouraged and depressed? You know, you ask those questions. When Sarah suggests to Abraham that he should sleep with her handmaiden, Hagar, neither one of them seemed concerned about the fulfillment of God's broader promises and purpose. This is, when we see this, we see humans' impulse at the best. Um, God can work, Can the question then we, we would ask, can God work through impulsive actions? So there's a couple of things to note here. One, Hagar is an Egyptian. It's often overlooked that the way she came into the family of Abraham was because of the escapade in Genesis chapter 12 and 13. In this text, we see that Abraham it journeys into Egypt, and he assumed that whenever Pharaoh saw uh, his wife, that he would kill Abraham and take her into his harem. When God intervened it, and it became clear that Sarah was the wife of Abraham, Pharaoh sent Abraham away after giving him several possessions, including female servants. Hagar would have been one of those female servants. In other words, Hagar's presence in Abraham's home is the direct result of Abraham telling a lie. Does God work through human failures like lying? And that, I, that's a real question that I have about several passages of Scripture. So the Bible seems to gloss over these personal details about whether Abraham and Hagar ever had sexual tension between them before this moment. Um, has Abraham ever had thoughts about having a, a sexual relations with um, this, this young, attractive woman? The Bible doesn't give us any of those details. We can ask those questions on our own. In fact, Abraham seems to view his sexual relations with Hagar as this mere marital transaction. Yet the Bible reader can sense these emotional issues that are lurking behind the text that we all, you know, it's one of those situations where it's like you can see the train coming and you know what's going to happen, but it, 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 you don't know what to do about it. So then you ask this question, can God work through a love triangle? Because that's essentially what we end up with. So after a Abraham slept with Hagar and she became pregnant, it's no surprise that it changed the relationships of everybody in the household. It caused tension to erupt between say, uh, Sarah and Hagar. Sarah might have been jealous of Hagar. Uh, Hagar seems to have moved into competition with Sarah as a second wife of Abraham. Sarah claims that Hagar has diminished her. Apparently, the handmaiden became a woman with attitude. You can see this in verse 3. She was looking at Sarah with disdain, uh, becoming guilty of reckless eyeballing. Uh, can God really be in control of such drama? It also seems to have changed the relationship between Sarah and Abraham. Sarah suggests that Abraham, as a head of the household, needs to accept some responsibility for the actions of his new wife. 
one can only imagine this couple on the couch at a marriage counselor's office, right? Their relationship seems to be going through this very rocky time. And the question <clears throat> then is, does God work in marital conflict? Abraham gave Sarah this permission to treat Hagar however he wanted to, uh, however she wanted to. So she abused Hagar. She so abused Hagar that she ran away. And to the reader's surprise, God sends an angel, a personal aid to pursue after Hagar. God does not usually send an aid after a runaway slave, and Genesis gives no explanation for this action. Hagar has become no ordinary runaway. She's carrying Abraham's child, and we cannot forget that. The covenant with Abraham was placed, has placed a mark upon his firstborn son, even though this is not the son of promise. God makes a promise to Hagar and a prophetic declaration over the child who is to be born. We see that God is not only concerned with the promised lineage, but even with those outside of the promised line. So, so though uh Ishmael is not the promised child, we see that God's promise still holds true. The angel instructs Hagar to go back to Sarah. This is not only contrary to Hagar's personal desire, it almost seems as if God is treating Hagar unfairly. He is sending her back into the midst of this conflict. He's sending her back into what is effectively a love triangle. He may be subjecting her to further mistreatment by her mistress. One would think that a God who is on the side of the impoverished and the oppressed would be more sensitive. So is God really involved in all of this drama? That's the question. Like, where, where is God in all of this? So let's talk about a couple of things, Cheryl. What message do we get about God's character from a story that mixes God's promise with such drama, flawed, uh, between flawed human beings? I feel like the main message that we get is that we can just manage to mess up anything, can't we? <laughs> I mean, gosh, I, yeah. You think you talk about the situation, and you think, how could they possibly have imagined that there was going to be a good outcome for this? And then I think about the fact that Hagar, ultimately, if she's a servant, had no choice in this whole situation. Right. You know, despite what her desires may or may not have been. She she didn't have a choice mm -hmm. in it. So then she was thrown into it and had to suffer the repercussions of it all. But then I also think about um, you know, Sarah's or Sarah's uh and Abraham had to have felt incredible regret for what they eventually had to realize was total disobedience on their part because that we're still paying for today. Yeah. To think about him coming to the realization we have waited for a child for all this time and now I've had it out of turn. Right. Mm -hmm. Like have I ruined all of the promises that God has made to us? Have is there a way for this to be redeemed? You see these kind of things playing out today still and mm -hmm. think about how we are so doggone impatient. Well, the thing about it is when you read it, it's like I said when I was going through the introduction lesson. On the outside, you know, you already know how this oh, yeah. is going to turn out, right? Mm -hmm. You know, if one of your friends came to you and said, hey, I'm thinking about letting my husband sleep with you know, another friend of ours and, and have a to child. To have a baby. Right. <laughs> See, on the outside, you go, that's the stupidest thing. I could, I, I mean, if that ever happens, I really hope you'll record it because I would like to hear your response. I have some ideas. It would be terrible. Right? We, on the outside, we can see it. Yeah. But when we're in the middle of it, mm -hmm. like when we're pressed, that is really what's going on. Mm -hmm. You know? There's a long gap between promise and reality. Yeah, what, 15 years? It's a long time. Yeah. And especially at their age. Right. And that waiting puts a lot of pressure on us mm -hmm. because we want everybody else to see what we've been saying is true. Mm -hmm. We want everybody else to see that God it's did faithful. is doing what he said he's mm -hmm. going to do, right? And then when it don't happen, we're embarrassed. And so we start trying to prop God up, mm -hmm. right? And um, 
you know, there are the the challenge with the text becomes where is God working and where is he not, mm-hmm. right? It, when is God in control and when is he not in control? There is there's one theory that says God's in control of everything and everything, you know, either happens at his order or his willingness. Do you ever wrestle with that? Do you ever struggle with how is God and where is God at in this? I do. I think I wrestle with it less than I used to because I feel like I have tried to learn to concentrate more on my trust in God and his faithfulness than my question for why he's doing things the way that he is. Mm -hmm. I think you have to do that because you have no control over the first part. Right. But you do have control over whether or not you're going to choose to trust him. Do you struggle to see how God is at work in, for lack of a better word, what we would call sinful situations? Like, it's hard for me to characterize this that way because this would have been, it wasn't God's will, but it was common practice during this time. What they did. Yes. Mm -hmm. It was, I mean, this wouldn't have been out of line for what you would, I mean, Solomon ends up with, you know, 700 concubines and 300 (laughs) wives. So it's, it's not like it's out of the character, but the, him thinking because I, until the preparation of this lesson I'd never given a lot of thought about how the angel of the Lord makes her go back into this situation mm-hmm. into a situation where she's probably going to be mistreated mm-hmm. do you struggle to f- see the hand of God in situations like that I think it's natural for all of us to struggle to a certain extent because we can always imagine how things could be wrapped up much nicer with a prettier bow mm-hmm. right but I think what we don't know about that situation and a lot of situations that we see where we can't understand is we don't understand what God is trying to do in that person. Mm -hmm. I think we often see what we imagine God is trying to do through that person, but I don't think that we understand what he's doing in their heart and what is he trying to change in them? What is he asking them to face and take responsibility for? How is he making them end up in a situation where they can choose to trust him more. Right. Um, I think we often overlook that part of tough situations like that because it's not. I mean, this is a perfect example of how the whole Old Testament's going to go, right? Mm-hmm. Everybody's so messed up. Everybody's going to be stupid. Yeah, and, and from <laughs> our outside view, we're like, how the heck can you make these decisions? But if we look at our own lives, we can see mirrors yeah. of a lot of those same things going on. We could make things much simpler on ourselves so that we didn't have to question God so much. But I believe a lot of these situations happen as a result of us pushing and trying to make things happen like they did when when we've lost our patience or we just think, well, he's not going to do it. So I'm going to figure out how to make it happen. I would agree with that. And it's, it's a, you know, in hindsight, sometimes as parents. There are, I can say as a parent, there have been times I wish I had let them have the consequences. Mm -hmm. And I wish I had let them sort through it themselves so that they could have learned a lesson. Mm -hmm. But instead, I rescued them from all of it. And I think there are times that, as you said, you know, God's trying to do something in us. There are times God lets us live with the consequences Mm -hmm. of our choices so that he can do in us what he wants to do because we're difficult to deal with. You know, I mean, even in Paul, Paul, Paul was struggled with pride and the Lord wouldn't take away the thorn in the flesh Mm -hmm. because if he did, we don't know who Paul would have been, you know? And so, you know, as much as I look back historically and think about all of the trouble that even still this day, the conflict that is between yeah, those two groups of people, that if God could have changed it, but what would we be like if, you know, 
if that didn't happen, if it was all this easy peasy, everybody made the right choice world. Yeah. And I, I try to often remind myself of that, you know, when you're talking about your situation with your kids too, that I do not believe that my faith would be as strong as it is today had I not been allowed to make choices and Mm -hmm. decisions that were bad and I had to suffer the consequences of them. Um, No doubt. Yeah. And I, and in the end, I'm thankful that I had parents who said, all right, we've given you what you need and now you got to figure it out. Yeah. Now you got to go out and, and live real life. And I think that God has a lot of wisdom and allowing that in us too, because it's, it's hard to grow when you're not being pressed. That's right. It's hard to grow when you're not, when you're not going through tough situations. Well, thank you for joining us today on this edition of One Single Story. We hope you'll be back with us uh, tomorrow as we continue a conversation around the book of Genesis. Mm -hmm.